What we're going to do now is just have a kind of broader um, conversation. There isn't lots of time, but hopefully a little bit enough time before we segue into um, more Q&A. So feel free, we've got a couple of questions in the Q&A box. Keep those coming. When that time comes, we'll um, try to get through um, a few of them. What uh, I think would be good now to just kind of collectively discuss, so anybody can feel free to kind of um, open up the floor really, but I suppose in, in different ways, you've all kind of um, touched upon it in your initial reflections, but essentially um, I'd like us to maybe begin with thinking about uh, where do you think we are right now in Britain regarding um, what Karen has called in her report, and um, I certainly would agree, these widespread myths that um, British police are unarmed and governed through consent. And this idea of consent is a very strange one because actually I don't think really that we do consent, but there's an argument to say though that we don't you know, um, there needs to be more of us that are dissenting. Um, but what do we think about this? Um, because oftentimes people still compare, for example, um, policing in Britain to policing in the USA, um, maybe as a way, quite a dishonest way to make ourselves feel better that although we can see the horrors and the egregious open example of violence there, somehow that's not quite, um, somehow that makes us feel better that maybe policing in Britain is, is not the same and is different. So I think um, it'd be good to maybe start off with just thinking about policing in Britain um, in 2022, especially um, after the uprisings of Black Lives Matter and all the things we saw um, with the women's marches, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so who feels like kind of opening the floor there and touching on that? Any one of you are welcome to. Uh, I can start with something, I'm just very brief. I mean, the most peculiar thing about like policing by consent is um, the notion that we have any option otherwise within the framework of what is viewed as uh, legal, right? So um, we're told that we're policed by consent, but we have zero capacity to opt for any option without resistance, right? Or without dismantling the system. But I would go further and kind of say that um, the myth of, the myth that both the British police forces um, governed by consent and secondly of their like being unarmed or just general lack of awareness around the particular issues of policing in Britain come from three things. So firstly, it comes from a, uh, an amplification of a single an amplification of a single um, story of policing in Britain, right? So uh, news channels are very quick to jump on Black Lives Matter in the States, right? And say, well, you know what, that's what's happening there. Compare it to Britain, we're not as bad as this, right? But then I think there's a second aspect to this, right? Um, which is that we're invited to think about policing as something which is separate from like immigration, and the kind of violence of the border. And we're also invited to think about policing, which is something which is separate from Britain's military kind of pursuits around the world, right? Um, when we bring all of those into the same rubric, it seems absurd to say that um, in a society where police uh, regularly use tasers on people, in a society in which um, police are empowered to, um, uh, to patrol with, uh, with with weapons in like major train stations, right? And in a society in which we've had a number of deaths, including some this year after contact with the police, um, that that's a society in which the police um, are unarmed. It's absurd. But in addition to that, um, the implication of them being unarmed is an implication that they're a benign force, right? And I think Emily spoke so brilliantly yeah. about how you know, even if they don't use weapons against us, the impact, the psychological impact of policing is such a huge harm. And then the final thing I'll say is that Britain's police force is an enabler of violence and kind of um, um, force around the world. After NSARS, the British government committed itself to a new package of assistance to Nigeria, including training for what are already incredibly corrupt and violent police forces around the country, but also weapons, right? Um, so I think it's, it's, it's important to not allow Britain to kind of let itself off the hook with that myth. Thank you very, very much, Annie, exactly. Um... I think absolutely everything that you're saying there is correct. I think it's always really important for us to remember uh, that Britain very much um, has exported violence across the world. Um, and oftentimes we can actually see the US as a child of um, UK's exportation of violence across the world. Um, so I, Karen, are you putting your hand up to join to say something next? I mean, I think Annie 
kind of said it all, but the only thing I wanted to add is I think that for certain communities, black, brown, working class communities in this in this country, I don't think that the, the idea of policing by consent, I think that's always been a fiction. And I think especially when you look at the realms of border control and counterterrorism, I think it's very difficult to sustain that fiction. Absolutely. And Adam, I wonder if you've got any um, views. Before. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's very hard to add to that very comprehensive answer that Annie gave. But I, I like um, what Karen just said. I think it's very easy um, for some sections of society to go about wholly um, uh, subscribing to and, and believing in this myth, genuinely, you know, walking through life with the like, with, with this like very strong belief in the fact that they are policed by consent. That, um, just because they don't happen to belong to certain sections of society that have seen the uh, the true face of the state, right? There's this polite exterior that's presented, but some of us are very much familiar with the, the true face of the state in terms of its capacity for violence. Um, and in terms of, you know, like things, things, things like citizenship deprivation, things like, you know, um, arrest and detention um, uh, after, 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 after the events of 7-7, we saw, you know, the, the, the um, extension of, of, you know, detention without a charge. Um, and and there's, there's various other things that, you know, we can continue to point to in terms of um, Muslim, uh, anti-Muslim racism being used as a way to open up the door for even more repressive um, uh, re repression in society, as well as, um, you know, racism more broadly and xenoracism um, or xenophobia, I prefer the term xenoracism. Um, you know, migrant communities, Muslim communities and black communities they they are when when you look at how the state treats people from these from these groups, you see very much the true face of the state. And I would argue that what we're seeing today is the expansion of these the the uh, the this uh, this the state's uh, treatment of these communities to the rest uh, of society. And that's why many are shocked, but not all of us. Thank you very much, Adam. And I can see, again, some important conversations in the chat too. Mentions of Australia, another place that um, we need to keep an eye on when it comes to policing and, of course, the connections historically and present um, with the UK as well. So thank you so much for that. Um, I am going to ask us our next question. Um, so again, I think that these conversations are not really divorced from the conversations that are increasingly kind of picking up pace here in the UK and have been conversations for some time, certainly in the US around abolition, okay? Um, so the report aims to challenge and disrupt the idea that war and policing are fundamentally different powers as is made very explicit in the report. Um, Karen talks about this war mentality and how it's infiltrated policing at various levels from counter-terrorism to anti-protest policing, to border control, and so on and so forth. Um, and to me, it feels like we need to also be, you know, critically challenging even our language over this term of over-policing, right? Um, there is definitely a fair question about actually what uh, level of policing even makes any sense because of everything that many of you, if not all of you have said to different degrees, right? The inherent nature, the inherent violence of policing as it stands as a construct. Um, so I guess I would like us just to maybe have that conversation around kind of how this maybe relates to the increasing conversations around abolition. Um, for I certainly for um, certain you know campaigners like myself anyway, we're thinking about the fact that reform is simply not enough. And again, some an area that can be quite spiky even among those of us who are in agreement to an extent is even thinking about the need to have bigger conversations actually about um, abolition when it comes to the. Um, the military and, and that kind of mentality. I think that is somewhere that people are very scared to go when it comes to, to having this conversation. So I'd be interested in anyone's um, kind of initial thoughts and reflections on that. I think we should trouble even some of the language that we use ourselves when we talk about policing, when we talk about war, when we talk about the military. So who was brave enough to dive in? Annie? And then Adam, and then perhaps Emily, we can bring you in as well. Yeah, Annie. Okay, um, so I guess the first thing to say is um, the issue, you know, I mentioned earlier, the issue is not just police, but the issue is police, right? And, and policing is essentially an approach to harm in society, which says what we must do is 
curtail people's freedoms. Um, and what we must do is respond not with restoration or, um, or transformative kind of justice, but rather respond with punishment. Two problems with this. Firstly, policing oftentimes by definition can only intervene after the fact, right? After a harm is done, then a sequence of events gets put into place. But also the idea of policing allows us to kind of um, offload collective responsibility for the social ills which produce what we term crime, right? Um, in order to prevent harm. So for example, some very predictable things. If you cut loads of funding to youth centers which give kids a, a safe place to go after school, it's highly likely that there may be an increase in crime in a particular area, right? If people are living in destitute, impoverished conditions, it's highly likely that there will be um, potentially an increase in crime. It's also um, highly likely that if you have a society in which people are criminalized for dissent, then there's going to be an increase in crime because people are still going to dissent against the kind of prevailing order, right? So I guess my kind of point is that um, going further um, than reform of police means rethinking as a society how we approach the question of harm. How do we create a society in which everybody is able to thrive and everybody is able to live in community with each other with a sense of collective responsibility to each other rather than offloading people who we think are the bad, uh, bad apples um, into prisons? Because people don't get punished because they did bad things. People get punished because they can't stop themselves from being punished. We know this because in our legal system and in legal systems across the world, wealthy people get off the hook for things um, that they've done wrong, while poor people have far less power to prevent themselves from being punished. And finally, I think it's also a challenge to kill the pop in our heads, right? One of the really important kind of aspects of the expansion of police powers in recent years is the introduction of duties, statutory duties on public bodies to begin to, to participate in the process of policing, whether that's in prevent and um, kind of placing responsibilities on doctors and teachers to refer people to um, prevent channels, or whether that's in terms of immigration, um, pulling on landlords and, 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 and people who are supposed to be part of our care, including sort of mental health practitioners to report on people's migration status, right? Um, that means that the, the mentality of policing has bled out into society, right? Um, in broader society, we are being told that it's our job to look at and surveil everyone around us and then report to the state so they can be punished because they're bad people. And I think if we're gonna take this challenge seriously, it's about transforming the institutions. It's also about transforming the way that we ourselves approach people that we kind of think of as having done harm or having potential to do harm. Thank you very, very much, Annie. Um, I think, Adam, you had unmuted earlier. Do you want to say anything in addition? Um, yeah, I, 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 just wanted, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, as, 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 a, as, as a child of refugees who isn't even a British citizen but happens to live in the UK, it's, it's, very, it's, very, it's very easy for me to, to, to see the hypocrisy of the border. Um, I, I happen to have been born in Europe. So I'm able to, you know, cross borders quite, quite, quite easily. But I see other Somalis, um, you know, uh, uh, same age, similar kind of context, perhaps in terms of the way in which their parents might have had to escape the war in the 90s. But they happen to land elsewhere to myself, and the way in which the state treats those um, individuals, it's very easy for me to see the hypocrisy very much clear cut to, uh, in terms of how, you know, it's. Some of us, uh, Sivanandan said that we wear um, we, we wear our passports on our faces, right? Um, and, uh, and 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 this this idea that this I guess the point I'm trying to say is it's it's easy for me to see that you know the argument, the case for for no borders, the case that we need to abolish the border, and also the police and armies um, as a whole. But for some of us, it might not be so. Uh, it might not be a logical jump because we, we 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 think that perhaps there are some protections that we that we receive from outsiders who may pose some kind of harm or threat to us. I think the real thing though that opens somebody up to seeing an alternative uh, way of organizing society is one um, trying to unlearn um, this idea 
that punishment is the only response that we can have towards a situation, right? That there can't be some kind of reconciliation, that there can't be alternative means to solve an issue where harm is done. The second thing is um, trying to unlearn this idea that competition is at the heart of every individual, at the heart of everything that happens in society, which is something that we've learned, um, this kind of logic of capitalism that's been instilled within us. And instead thinking about cooperation, right? And that, that opens us up to possibilities uh, many much more possibilities, things like mutual aid, um, which in itself is something that can open us up to alternative ways of organized society, which would do away with the concept of borders. We're not saying to just destroy everything today, right? We're saying to rework the very foundations of society and radically transform it into something that is much more workable for all sections of society that doesn't just work for a select few and intentionally is broken system for the rest of us. Um, and I think lastly um, is, is, is having like a politics of hope, not one of fear. Having true hope in the, um, in, uh, and, and, and a genuine belief in others, I think is, is the only way that we, can, that we can move forward. And that's something that's very difficult to do, especially when, we're told by every uh, section of society in terms of mainstream media, politicians, and everyone is telling you to, to fear this and to fear that. You know, it's, it's, it's quite hard to have a politics of hope, um, but I think we need, really desperately um, need that today. Um, and I think that's something that abolitionists offer to the rest of us. It's something that will save all of us. Thank you very much, Adam. I'm going to invite Emily to um, throw some thoughts in before we move on to the final question, which um, I'll ask Karen directly, um, and then we'll go into the Q&A. So, Emily, your thoughts on that? I, yeah, I mean, I don't have much to add to those brilliant contributions. I mean, they, they sort of say it all. Um, the only thing I'll add is I think there's been so much progress in sort of talking about the, talking about abolition being a sort of spiky topic. Just over the last two years, the progress that we've made in having these conversations, that we're having these conversations now on, on this webinar, that where I live, you know, I live in Cornwall. So, you know, that's not a traditional place where we talk about abolition, but we've been able to talk about these issues on our protests and those messages are getting out. And I think there's been a real shift in the narrative about how we talk about policing, about recognizing systemic racism and sexism and classism in policing and how that manifests in our communities and how there are alternatives to that and how people are resisting that with things like the cop watch groups, with the kill the bill movement, with all these sort of different angles. And it feels like we're in a slightly different place now to where we were even two years ago. And I think what Ellen was saying about hope, that gives me hope because we are changing that, that dialogue. We're changing that narrative and hopefully we can start working and building ourselves towards some of these other sort of solutions and away from this sort of carceral system that we've all been indoctrinated into. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Emily. Indeed, I just put in the chat box, it does feel like even to have this conversation in the UK and there's a bit more curiosity and a bit more openness um, to at least hearing the conversation and being like, well, you know, I don't necessarily get it, but I'm going to go and read. I'm going to go find out a bit more and fine. Maybe you're right. There are some alternatives. What are they? That conversation, um, it feels like we're in a healthier place, agreed, even than just two years ago. Um, and finally, before we um, head over, um, just as someone says, it's really refreshing. Yeah to speak of hope. Um, before we head over to the Q&A section, um, we've got a good amount of questions already in the Q&A box, um, but you're welcome to add a few more. Um, I'd like to actually just ask this question to Karen, um, especially. So Karen, obviously you have a particular interest in tech um, and biometrics. We know this, you've said this. Um, and I guess I just wanted to ask your thoughts and further reflections on this idea that, you know, basically regarding policing, surveillance and tech companies, especially in this increased digital age, accelerated, I think, further by the global pandemic, and the obvious need for um, technological advancement. What will the role of campaigners, activists, and even those working in so-called tech for good be regarding um, holding policing to account and even tech companies that are supporting increasing militarization? Um, just handing over to you. And then if we have time, maybe Emily as well, because you mentioned this a little bit in your talk as well. So Karen. Yeah, it's a great question. And I would love to hear from others because at the end of the day, I, I'm, I'm not a campaigner, but... Um, 
I, I think that there have already been some recent efforts to give one example, to call for a moratorium on facial recognition technology. Um, and I think one technique is more just to call for full scale moratoriums on problematic techno technologies. I don't think that always is an effective technique, especially when that technology has already made its way into um, you know, in, into policing practice, but I do think we've seen examples of that globally, of that, of that sometimes working. Um, I think just many more demands for transparency, I think this actually touches on one of the questions asked in the Q&A, uh, between the kinds of contracts um, between tech companies and policing bodies, and demands for greater transparent, transparency, greater public scrutiny. I know that all sounds very abstract, but I think those are some techniques that can help um, ward off the very problematic uh, use of these technologies. And at the end of the day, and I think this touches on some of the questions that are being asked in the chat, it's also, there's limits to what you can do. And there's, there's it's also important not to feed into, especially if you're an activist, feed into kind of fear and paranoia around surveillance, but also taking some basic precautions. Um, even if, though I recognize that's much more on an individual level as opposed to necessarily collective level, but um, uh, to give you know one example, um, there's a scholar who cited throughout the, the report, Adam Elliott Cooper, who, who writes about the really discriminatory practice of using joint enterprise um, to criminalize, especially young black men, often based on really dubious conclusions based on the social media posts that, that are made or, or the kinds of you know, music that, that they post on, on social media sites. So I do think that the individual and the collective are linked and also finding ways to, to protect yourself against certain kinds of surveillance is also key. Um, I suspect many other people on this call though would have better answers than I just gave to that very, very important question because it, it is very troubling, the, the increasing role of the private tech sector in policing in ways that I think are often very, very opaque. Thank you so much, Karen. Actually, this your answer and um, some of this conversation actually, I feel, does answer a couple of the questions in the chat box at the moment around surveillance, um, especially. So, Emily, can I just invite you as well to add any thoughts on sort of technology surveillance, etc.? Um, yeah, I and mean, I think it is. I mean, it is that joint thing of not letting it scare us into not taking action and saying who we are, and that is really important. But taking the steps to keep ourselves off the databases to um have this awareness of how this stuff is being used and i think some of those things around sort of resisting surveillance and it goes back to sort of also just some very key points it's not just big tech it's things like don't talk to the police don't talk to police liaison officers you know don't give them that information on the street don't be fooled into thinking you're having a friendly chat with the police because there is no such thing as a friendly chat with the police and that information will then go on your police file and it is things like um you know we all need to use social media these days you know it is a campaigning tool and we need to use it as a campaigning tool but think about what you're sharing you know take out the metadata from photographs blur people's faces you don't have to put that information out there for everyone to see and think about who you are putting at risk as well because you might think well this was just a nice sort of fluffy protest nothing happened I can just sort of post these pictures but you don't know who you're going to impact on that you know and especially um you know sort of people from marginalized communities when you're sort of talking about policing you know like it is not just you that you have to worry about it it's everyone else around you and I think, yeah, campaigns around sort of specific issues as well around tech. And I think, you know, some of the really good things that could come out of this report are looking at how we campaign and how we organise around these specific sort of pieces of tech and also sort of educating people about these specific pieces of tech. Because I think sometimes when you talk about these things, people can sort of sometimes look at you as if you're being a bit sort of conspiracy minded about it. Oh, the police aren't really keeping these databases or the police re really doing this. 
and so sort of having that education around these sort of this technology at the same time as campaigning against it and being sort of really strategic about well which bits of this can we look at which where where are the places where we can have an impact and actually shut shut these sort of different things down so I think there's a sort of lot to look at and I think that's what's really exciting about the report is it gives us those um, campaigning opportunities. Brilliant. Thank you very, very much. Emily, um, Annie, you wanted to add something very, very brief before we move into the Q&A. Yep. Yeah, just very briefly. I remember back after the George Floyd, the wave of George Floyd protests when the government first tried to introduce the police crime sentencing bill. Um, and there was a, a rally held online by Sisters Uncut and a number of other organizations, right? And I think that rally was one of the most exhilarating um, things I experienced um, kind of politically in the UK. And the reason why is because going forward, what we need to do is connect dots, right? We are being taught by the media who have like cycles in order to generate kind of hysteria and get loads of people clicking on their articles to think about things as single issues. But if anything you take away from today, these things aren't single issues, right? The gang matrix is connected to prevent, is connected to policing at the border, is connected um, to stop and searches in our communities, is connected to imperialism abroad. And drawing those connections is gonna be really important if we're gonna to hope to build a movement with the level of strength to take on the kind of gargantuan task ahead of us. You know, there are no mistakes. It's a big challenge. It's going to be difficult to transform society, but the reality is there are more of us than there are of them, and everybody has a stake in a world without policing. Thank you so much, Annie. What a great way to close off this particular section.